We're going to continue in our study today in uh, the book of Colossians. I invite you to turn there in chapter 1. Uh, we're going to end chapter 1 and move into chapter 2. As we're looking at the, uh, um, the in crowd at church, uh, maybe that means something different. When you're in school, uh, the in crowd may have been those who were popular, the popular kids at school, maybe the athletes and the beauty queens, but uh, I'm not talking about that whenever I talk about the in crowd. I'm talking about the in crowd at church, and certainly I don't want to further the division among uh, churches. Uh, there are enough divisions as it is. There are uh, Catholic and Protestant, and then among the Protestant, there are different denominations of Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian and so forth. Uh, and then among the Baptists, there are regular Baptist and hardshell Baptist and Northern Baptist and missionary Baptist and Baptist Cooperative Fellowship and Southern Baptist. Among Southern Baptists, there are those that are Armenian and those who are of uh, sovereign grace and those who are liberal and those who are conservative. I'm not talking about division here. I'm talking about something different within the church that Paul sees. Uh, there wasn't a division in the church uh, when Paul uh, shares this letter. Uh, when he came into Colossae or when a believer would come into any town, uh, they wouldn't go to a different denomination. They would just go to church. And uh, they would go to the New Testament church, what I call a Jesus church. And, uh, and there's been a lot of churches that started out as a Jesus church, but they've lost their focus and lost their message. And so I want to highlight the qualities that should take place and the experience that you should have whenever you are in a Jesus church. Look there in Colossians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 28, and then we'll move on into chapter 2. He says, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. And then chapter 2 and verse 1, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with a persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. A Jesus church is not made of brick and mortar. Whenever I was a kid, we had this little thing, if my arthritic fingers will let me do it. Uh, here's the church, y'all remember that? Here's the church, and here's the steeple, and open the door, and here are all the people. Well, that's not really correct. It would be, here is the building, and here's the steeple, and open the door, and here's the church. That, that may not rhyme, but that is correct. The church is not made of a building. We call this First Baptist Church, but really, this is where First Baptist Church meets. The church is people. And whenever you come together as a Jesus church, you ought to expect to be in the in crowd. You ought to have experiences. And what you should experience in the in crowd in a Jesus church, there are five. The first experience you ought to have is that you can be instructed. See what I did there? Instructed. Look what he says. He says in verse 28, we proclaim him. Not just theology, not just doctrine about him, but Paul says we proclaim him. Now in Paul's day, there were a whole lot of spiritual messages that were going on. The Gnostics would say, uh, oh, we have a secret knowledge and you have to get a little deeper in to understand uh, the Judaizers would say, well, if you're going to really follow after Jesus, then you have to uh, keep all the law and practice all the ceremonialism, and then you can follow Jesus. Paul's just coming into town, and he says, I proclaim him. I'm preaching Jesus. That means whenever Paul came into town and he preached Jesus, he preached the gospel message, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. 
and that if we will in repentance turn away from our sin and turn to him, believing, trusting him, if we'll call upon him, then we can be saved. That's the gospel message, and it's the same message today. Paul would preach him, Jesus. At a Jesus church, you can be instructed in Jesus, to follow Jesus. And then Paul would, secondly, he would preach to be able to build up and to encourage, uh, to edify, to admonish the believers. Hear what he says in verse 28. He says, uh, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man. That means, that means to point in the right direction. There's a lot of churches that you come and there's not admonishing from the pulpit. I can remember growing up, there were a lot of sermons that I sat through that were about what you don't do, the thou shalt nots. You don't, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't dip. That's a point that my grandmother would turn to her friend and say, he's gone from preaching to meddling now. Don't dip. I've heard sermons preach about don't go to the movies. I told you one time a preacher said, what would you do if you were in the movie and Jesus came back? And I thought I'd miss the rest of the movie. Don't go to movies. As a child, I didn't fully understand. I heard sermons preaching about don't shack up. I didn't know what that meant. I thought that meant don't live in poorly constructed homes. Don't shack up. I know what it means now, but I've heard sermons about all of the things that you don't do. Uh, it's kind of like whenever I was a child, we had quite often what now people call country fried steak. We didn't call it that because if it was at our house, it was country, and if it was meat, it was fried. So um, country fried steak, we called it pound steak. How many of y'all called it pound steak? Because my mother would pound it out. I've seen her pound it with a, with a meat cleaver. I've seen her pound it with a Coke bottle. And I remember asking my mama, Mama, why, why do you pound that meat? She said, I'm going to make sure this cow's dead. <laughs> she was tenderizing it. And then she had floured up and we'd fry it and we'd eat it. But that sometimes is all that people get whenever they come to church is they just get pounded over their head. That, there's not much admonishing there. There's not much instruction that goes there. What if you were, now, nowadays if you go on a trip, you got GPS. You just plug in where you're going and it'll tell you, uh, take a left in 500 yards. Uh, I always hear at some point in the trip, in 100 yards, make a U-turn. It'll tell you where to go on it. I mean, it'll, your destination on the left. But we haven't always had that. And even now, we still need some road signs. And so if you were going to go to Nashville and you saw this, you would know which way to turn. I don't want to go that way. I'll go to Memphis. I want to go this way, and I will go to Nashville. What if all the signs just said, don't go this way, don't go this way, don't go this way? That would be so frustrating. And some people approach coming to church and be involved in, in church as just the things that we're not supposed to do. That's not what Paul's saying. He says, I come now that I want to give you the way to go. I want to give you some direction in life. That's what you ought to experience whenever you come to a Jesus church that you are instructed. The second experience that you should have is that you ought to learn how you are energized, how you're energized. Look in verse 29. He says, For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Jesus' churches point to where our strength and our real energy comes. It's not us serving and doing in our own effort. It is that Jesus is within us and that he brings that out of us. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. That word for power is the word dunamis in, in Greek. It's where we get our word dynamite, our word dynamic from it. In the early 20th century, uh, A.J. Uh, Gordon was a pastor, went to the New York City Fair, and um, World's Fair in New York City. And from a distance, he saw a, uh, a man with a hand pump pumping water. And from a distance, he, he kept watching him, and he was amazed at his stamina and how much volume of water that was coming out. Well, the closer he got, he realized that it wasn't a man. It was just the figure cut out wooden man with hinges that the pump was being run by an electric motor 
The man wasn't pumping the water. The water was pumping the man. And the world looks at us and they say, oh, how, what, what are they doing? And they look at our, and they think it's us. No, it is what is inside of us. He says that we have a power and a strength within us. It's not the water pumping the man. It's not the man pumping the water. It's the water pumping the man. As you stop and think about what Jesus said, John chapter 7, verse 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I don't have to have the confidence in myself if I've got confidence in the Lord. Whenever I say, I don't know what to say, I have confidence God's going to put the words there. Whenever I say, I don't have the courage to be able to go, that I have confidence that God's going to provide what I need. Whenever God tells me to do something, he always equips me to do what he tells me to do. All I have to do is be obedient to him. And let him bring that strength out of us. If you are in a Jesus church, you ought to expect to be instructed. You ought to expect to hear where we get our energy. The third experience that you ought to have in a, in a Jesus church is that you should be encouraged. Look in chapter 2 and verse 2. That their hearts may be encouraged. Having been knit together in love and attained to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself. I believe one of the main reasons that God asks us to come together as a church is to encourage one another. And I believe that as we do come together, that we, we all need encouragement. It's kind of like, it's kind of like standing on that free throw line. All eyes are upon you sometimes, and you hear the crowd roar, but you hear those people say, you can make it, you can do it. And that, that, that cheering that, that drives you on, that makes you want to do more, it makes you want to try harder, it makes you have confidence to be able to stand there and know that others are, are for you and encourage you. We need that spiritually. I love the way Eugene Peterson uh, worded Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. He said, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worship together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day coming. Everybody needs encouragement, and it is powerful. There's a book out, uh, it's written by Joshua Wolf Snick, and he, uh, the name of the book is Lincoln's Melancholy. And um, Abraham Lincoln, time has, and history has served him well. But Abraham Lincoln, and he describes in that book of how he had bouts of depression. We know his wife was deeply depressed. He had great depression as well. Uh, from the death of his children, and just think of what our nation was going through, and he was our president. Uh, our nation was divided. And there would be times, there would be days when he would go without any sleep, and then there would be other times when he couldn't get out of bed. And you just think of all the stress and the pressure in his life. On April 14th, 1865, uh, John Wilkes Booth came into the Ford Theater and shot President Lincoln in the head. He didn't die immediately. They carried him across the street, and we have much of the records of what took place that night. But there were some of the details that were not released until 1976. One of those being the content of his pockets. In his pockets, Abraham Lincoln had uh, a pocket knife, a uh, watch fob, a, um, uh, two pairs of uh, reading glasses, one spectacle case. In his wallet, he had $5, but it was in Confederate money. And then he had some newspaper clippings. And one of those newspaper clippings, you could tell, has been well worn because it had been folded and unfolded, and apparently he brought it out to read it quite a bit. And that clipping was an article written by an English uh, writer, John Bright. And John Bright in that article wrote this, Abraham Lincoln is one of the greatest men of all time. Abraham Lincoln kept that. And it was obvious that he would take it out and he would unfold it and he would look at it. That is a lesson about the power of encouragement. Every one of us could tell about times in our own lives when somebody was our cheerleader. When somebody, and the word literally means it is the uh, same word as uh, paraclete, it is uh, 
word that, that means to come alongside. Every one of us has somebody at one time or another when we were down and discouraged and, and that we needed to hear a word that God put somebody in our path who came along beside of us. I believe that as a Jesus church that we ought to know that we can be instructed, that we find our energy in him, but that we ought to be encouragers to one another. The fourth experience in a Jesus church is that you ought to be included. He says there in verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love. That is a beautiful picture. Um, if you knit, Lynn doesn't knit, she, but sometimes she crochets. Knitting is where you have two needles. I understand you move loops back and forth between those. Crocheting has a hook and that you make those loops and, a, and loop those onto the whole piece, afghan or whatever you're making, onto the whole piece. But that's the picture here, is that you take all these different yarn, different colors, and that through God's love and what God does is that he loops us together and the Holy Spirit loops us together. And all of our electronic connection and all of our social media, people are more alone right now than they've ever been. People are more disconnected than they've ever been about what is really important. And that is what a church ought to be. A church should not be just a showcase for shiny Christians. A church is a hospital for sick, broken sinners who have been saved by God's wonderful grace and that we come together and God knits our hearts together and that we encourage and that we love each other, knit together in love. The last thing is that a Jesus church ought to experience that we are enriched. Now, y'all know me. I am not a health and wealth snake oil preacher. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that if you'll just trust Jesus, that you'll never have any sickness and that you'll be a millionaire by Tuesday. You won't hear me say that. I don't believe that. God sometimes uses sickness and difficulties in our life to build our character. You've heard me say many times, God's much more interested in my character than he is my comfort. But I do believe that every believer ought to be rich. If you define rich as that your needs are met and you have the capacity to enjoy life. And by that definition, there are a lot of millionaires in the world who aren't rich. What he says, look in verses 2 and 3, he says that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus, we have access to the greatest riches in all the universe. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, not so that that, that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. There are all kind of clay vessels. That's what he's talking about, that it's just, that we, this is a clay vessel. You see all kind of vessels, clay vessels. They're different shapes, different sizes, different colors. And as you look at those, but, but every one of those are meant to hold something. The importance of the vessel, matter of fact, a vessel can be cracked or broken. But what's important is what's on the inside of that vessel. You may have beautiful china at home, but it's made to hold food. If it doesn't have something in it, it's, I don't care how beautiful it is, it's just an empty vessel. And that's where we come recognizing that we are enriched. It is what is inside of us. And you can be energized and you can be instructed and you can be encouraged and you can be enriched and you can be included and that's what Jesus churches do but inevitably I hear people say occasion you know well I just didn't get anything out of church today well that's not really the question is it the real question is not what am I going to get out of church today but what have you invested in church today I mean if you 
say, well, I just didn't get anything out in church. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't get instructed. Well, let me ask you, did you open your Bible? Did you open it on your phone? Is it just because the preacher puts the scripture on the, because I'll take it off if that'll help. You say, well, you know what, I just, uh, I just, I didn't get any, I wasn't energized today. Well, did you sing? Or do you just complain about who can't sing? You say, well, you know what, I just wasn't encouraged today. Well, the question is not who's going to encourage me. The question is, who can I encourage today? Encouragement is kind of like they say, it's like a boomerang. If you give encouragement, encouragement's always going to come back to you. It's like a boomerang. What do you call a boomerang that doesn't work? A stick. And if you don't look to encourage somebody, don't be surprised if you wind up just being a stick in the mud. You see, the question is not what am I going to get out of church today, but it is what am I going to invest today. And if you come looking for Jesus to speak to your heart, and that you've come and that you've prayed for the preacher. I guarantee you, if you'll pray for me, I'll be a much better preacher. If you'll pray for your Sunday school teacher, I guarantee you, you'll get more out of the lesson whenever you put something into it. If you come and you participate and you let the words of the song touch your heart, and I don't care if you sing beautifully, just sing. Sing. I don't, sometimes I don't sing by... Note, I sing by letter. I just rear back and let her fly. You just sing from your heart and from your soul. You let that message come into you, and then you bring that back in worship to God. And I will guarantee you, our choir will sound better whenever you are participating. Y'all sound good anyway. <laughs> but you know, who, you know who gets more out of the special music and the... Uh, Y'all do. And it comes across because they put something into it. Every Wednesday night, our prayer meeting crowd prays for our choir. And that's why you sing so pretty. <laughs> I've got one last verse, and I would be amiss for us to miss out on this. You know, some people that I believe may be the most invested in what goes on here are the people in verse 5. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. There are some people right now that are at home, and they would love to be able to come and to be here. And whenever they could, they, they were here. But they can't do that now. They physically cannot do that. But every week, whenever our TV guys come together and Brother Jeremy or, or Brother Brock come in the middle of the week, sometimes late at night, and they get that ready and it's broadcast over WCBI, my Mississippi. And I have people all the time that will write me a letter and say, you don't know me, but... I come to your church every Sunday by way of television, and I can't go to my own church anymore. What an encouragement. Mr. Ginger got a note this week about a dear lady from Columbus who, who uh, has been touched by our service. Uh, I had a lady yesterday say, you're the preacher down at First Baptist Church, and uh, I kind of got, well, uh, maybe. <laughs> and she said, I've, I've watched your service, and I, I, I appreciate you. I've got folks that tell me every week we watch the service. Ed and Bruce are home right now. They got up and got ready to go to church, but they can't come, so they're watching on TV. And there are hundreds and hundreds of others who no longer can be here, but they are here, and they are invested, and so should we. Let me ask you this morning, not what did you get out of church, but what did you put into it? Because that's what a Jesus church does. Maybe God's laid something on your heart this morning. Maybe there's some um, instruction that he has given you, some way he's drawn you closer to himself. And this morning he wants you to decide.
to live that out. Maybe there's a public decision you need to make. Maybe you need to come join this church and be a part of this fellowship. Maybe you've never been saved. And today you recognize that you need to get in the game. That you need to surrender your life to our Lord Jesus. Whatever God has laid upon your heart, you need to be obedient today. Let's stand and we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And as God moves in your heart, you be obedient to him. I'll be at the front as we sing.